Hey there, and welcome to the Child of the Redwoods live show. I'm Aubrey Hargis, and this is my husband, David, and we are two former public school teachers here to talk about the most, really the reasons why we chose to homeschool our own children. <laughs> and we do that by also talking about Montessori, talking about what's going on in our own lives. And today we've got something very special. It's a very exciting conclusion. That's right. It's the fifth and final part of our book study of The Child is the Teacher. Uh, if you've not been reading along, that's okay. It's a great book. It's really easy, fast read, uh, lots of fun, great Great, um, great writing, uh, and uh, you can catch the first four installments on po on our podcast or here on YouTube if you're watching, and, uh, and and go back to the beginning or just hang out and listen to our thoughts. We're going to do five today and um, some wrap up conclusions. So excited to talk about it! And this was an, another great section of the book. Yeah, yeah, it was. Oh my gosh, I loved the ending of this book. Just I, ha I pulled out several quotes to talk to you guys about. Um, if you have any questions about anything that we've talked about so far and the parts before, if you were joining us for the previous parts, um, we'd love to hear those in the comments if you happen to be watching live. And if you're listening on the podcast, I'm happy that you're here too. You can always shoot us an email at hello at child of the redwoods. And David and I both get those messages. And um, we'd be happy to chat with you. All That's right. right. Yeah. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so last time we ended up kind of taking some detours <laughs> in our conversation. <laughs> yep. A lot of stuff has been going on um, in both in the world that we wanted to talk about and in our own lives. Um, the past week for us has kind of been a blur. Uh, life just doesn't stop. <laughs> Things, just events just keep on rolling at you and you just keep trying to walk along and do the best you can uh, while parenting your children through right. the challenging times. Um, and sometimes that's really all you can do, you know, and I think it's really important for us to remember that during this period, this moment in time when we've got a lot of collective stress around us, um, I think it's important to realize that everyone is going to be reacting in their own way. Um, one example is I went to the grocery store last night. I was shocked at the prices. <laughs> um, I think I saw there was toothpaste for $9 and oh my gosh, just the, the produce even. Usually when you buy a lot of fruits and vegetables, you can kind of get your grocery bill lower. Um, but it's just right. raising to an almost teenager, <laughs> like a 12 year old and a, a full on teenager. They eat a lot. Yeah. They, they eat a lot of food. <laughs> so it was shocking Ravenous. to me. But um, I also noticed a lot of people in the grocery store were also struggling emotionally. There was a lot of tension well, there. Well, we've been seeing it come for a while. Yeah. You know, the last for months now, just I'm sure is affecting everybody who's listening or watching. Just the cost of everything is going up. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard on families, especially, you know, you've got not only yourself to feed <laughs> and provide that roof, but you've got your little ones. Uh, it's just very, very difficult and very stressful. And um, it just seems to be getting worse and worse. And that example of the $9 toothpaste, this wasn't, we didn't go to some kind of fancy, fancy store either. This is a regular grocery store buying regular toothpaste. And, um, the, you know, at some point where you have to ask, like, what is actually an essential item? It just <laughs> When does toothpaste become an extravagant a thing. Yeah, the week before there was no deodorant in the aisle. Yeah. And that that I don't know, I think little things like that can really add to your stress load as a parent. Absolutely. They because they're so out of your control too. Yeah. It can feel like what exactly can I do? I can't make my own toothpaste. I guess I could use baking well, soda. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, we could get into that. You could <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, we could. We have used baking soda in the past. So it's hard on your like... teeth. You have to. <laughs> Most people don't like the taste of soap, but you they can. Don't. You use can use. It. I have brushed my teeth with soap. <laughs> so yeah, so I mean, for everything. Are, I don't know. So I feel like um, I feel like environmentally, um, culturally, we're kind of coming out of a time where there's a lot, a little more frivolous spending, and we're really collectively coming into a time when we're starting to feel the pinch more. And um, I think that that mean what that means for us at Child of the Redwoods is that I'm grateful that we've always had an emphasis on the scrappy approach to yeah. Montessori. You know, it's really for me, 
especially kind of concluding this book and hearing Maria's Montessori's message again, like the kind of culmination of her philosophy. Um, it's really solidifying my dedication to making the work that we do as affordable for families as possible. And so you guys should know that behind the scenes, this is something David and I have been talking mm -hmm. about a lot. Like um, what are, what are we, you know, what are we going to do to be able to help more families give a Montessori education to their children That's right. um, and to encourage, you know, families who want to homeschool to show them how you can do that on a very, very limited budget. It really can be done. It can be done well, it can. Um, but it, it helps to have some people who have um, kind of paved the way to learn from, you know, to know that you don't have to spend those big bucks on all of the materials or on these gigantic expensive programs. Seems everybody is wanting to sell homeschoolers things. Um, so definitely, you know, that's something that we're talking about. Um, and we hope that the programs that we offer are not only affordable, but are actually practically helpful to you using an approach that isn't an extravagant approach that is something mm -hmm. that's very very practical that you can apply in your own home yep. yeah exactly there's a there's a whole lot of to think and say about all that but i think i will keep that uh on the back burner for now um just to say that it, um i think the world does not make it easy to parent uh, and it doesn't make it easy to embrace a family-centric life, and it's becoming harder uh, for many, many people, uh, and that is a real sin uh, as a society. So it's something Maria tried to think through, I think, whether she was successful or not, or naive or, or wise. It's, well, she only had one lifetime. <laughs> she only had the one lifetime to live, yeah, and she right. did live through it's a lot so of interesting work. things. <laughs> It's only so much work one person can do in their own lifetime, Exactly. Right? We just have to keep continuing to build upon that journey and expanding. That's right. So, yeah, of course she didn't complete. Yeah, and she she knew it at the very end of this book. You know, we'll get to that. But she even talks about how she didn't feel like she was finished. Like, people still don't really understand. I want to help people really more clearly understand the method and to really get children. And, and she just never felt like she was quite there and right. it makes sense you know um there's still many more people in the world who who can learn about this amazing method of education who don't yet know about it Correct. um it's still it's still taught in small circles it is know? that's right so well anyway i think uh there's a lot on that so do you um are you ready to start or do you want to no Let's go ahead and do a recap okay because i feel like i'm trying to remember how far we got but i feel like we talked about the glass classroom a lot we did, did yeah talk about mussolini at all yeah you want do you want to talk a little bit about the fascist <laughs> the fascist part of maria's journey which is not super savory um but it is yeah i mean part of it well i think we could talk about it in the context of this chapter or the section if yeah. we want to um I mean, essentially, you know, she lived in a really dynamic time. And I think, um, I think actually we're living in a pretty dynamic time as well. I guess, you know, you would argue that all, all moments in history are, can be intense in a certain way. She certainly was a person who straddled two very distinct worlds, which I think informs the contradiction of her nature, right? There's a part of her, she was born in the, what, 1870, in the 1870s, very much uh, a Victorian lady, middle class Victorian yes. lady, wore gloves and the you know all the sorts of things you might imagine. Was a scientist, uh, was uh, invested in the progress of humankind uh, in a in a way that is kind of speaking to that nineteenth century sort of zeal. But uh, then she, you know, continued to live. Lived a very long time, well into the the middle of the twentieth century. I think she died in nineteen fifty three. So had lived a very long life and had seen, among other things, the invention of flight, the electrification of the world, or the Western world at least, of the U.S. and parts of Europe, um, you know, the advent of automobiles, um, World Wars One and Two, and the horrors that those begot, the, the germ theory. I mean, it's just the number of things, mass communication, radio, television, film. I mean, these things are all invented or 
expanded greatly in her lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so she was kind of a person of two worlds. Uh, it toward the end, you know, at the beginning of her life, as you read through the book, she's traveling by coach, um, mm -hmm. horse, maybe walking, um, and train, of course. Uh, but then by the end of her life, she's flying. Like uh, there's a section in the book where it talks about how she will get up in the morning and leave. I can't remember where she was, maybe Amsterdam or something. Mm -hmm. Fly to London, give a lecture, or have a tea or whatever it was, and then fly back. Fly back home. <laughs> yeah. So like the jet set lifestyle, uh, the 1940s version of that. Um, doing things that were con inconceivable at the time of her birth and for most of her early life, there were no airplanes. You did not fly. Uh, yeah. You could glide. There were you know, hot air balloons or something. <laughs> well, you can attest uh, somewhat to that lifestyle, you know, not, not, I think as intensely. Maria seemed to be constantly traveling and on the Certainly. go with, Mar with Mario, her son. Um, but I know that every time you would come home from international travel, it was exhausting. It would take you like two weeks to recover for sure emotionally and just physically from that effort of, of just being on the plane for so long and being in a culture that's unfamiliar. Um, even if you'd been there several times, it was, mm -hmm. you, there was a recovery period. And so this, book talks a little bit about that, about how just incredibly exhausting this lifestyle that she chose was, and yet she was still just driven over and over and over. She, there was no place that she didn't want to go fly to and to explore. And uh, really the, the war kind of stopped that for her, you know, and she was interned in India for a while and really had to just I don't know. Sometimes, you know, sometimes there are blessings, right? In mm -hmm. the way that uh, we find ourselves in this really busy, busy pace, and then there'll be some kind of world event <laughs> or something that kind of makes you stop your busy lifestyle and, yes, and right. you kind of realize that there's all this space in there for more thinking, you know, or for more dreaming. And so I really liked that this part five talked about that part of her life. That's a part of her life that I really personally respect mm -hmm. um, is, you know, it was almost like um, you know, she took this trip to India and World War II was beginning at that time. And uh, she found herself in this environment, this culture that was very different from her own and her, ex her expansion of her method, it just like blossomed at that point. And this is, you know, she's fairly old at this point, you know, mm -hmm. and yet uh, this is when I think the the most amazing parts of the method really start to well, shine Well, it's certainly through. a new aspect of her work yeah. comes out. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So, right. Uh, that's, that I think all feeds into the contradiction. So to, to the question about Mussolini, you know, it's impossible to really put yourself in that position. But again, she was born uh, in a very different world. So by the time you get to the 1920s and the rise of fascism, I mean, there's been so much change. I think we now, and even then in the fifties, you know, she was nominated three times for the peace prize, never won probably in large part because she was associated with Mussolini and fascism. Uh, if not, um, even if she disavowed it, it, the damage was done because she just underestimated, I think would be the kindest way to say it what it meant she thought you know whoever is in power and can help me achieve my mission my mission is greater than earthly confines whatever right so politics mean nothing to me mm -hmm. what i want is to help children and i think to change the world you have to start with children so whatever corruption there is on this earth perpetuated by adults like Mussolini is part of the earth that we have the material world and we you know are trying to do something more and uh, after the war and well into today, and I think even probably in the last few years, we would look back at that and say that's a that's a level of naivete that is not forgivable, that you can't you can't make nice with a person like Mussolini. It's not like he wasn't already well known to be a pretty bad guy <laughs> by the time she was dealing with them. I mean, these, these were um, I don't know what the right word to use is anymore, but they were they were really, really, really bad people, right? These are, um, I was thuggish. I don't know what is the right word to say. They, you know, beating people, killing them, this, you know, and, and she kind of was willing to turn a blind eye to that. Uh, and similarly in the 30s. I think she felt like what she was doing was so much, had so much potential. If she could get even people who weren't good people 
on board with this idea of raising children this way. I think she naively felt like she could overcome that's that right it, that it would justify you know that it would justify it and you know to that you know on a, on a smaller scale you know we see teachers doing the same thing in corrupt school systems today you know i i remember when teaching i had this very grandiose dream that i would work within this environment that was very toxic to children um and radiate this little beam of light <laughs> uh, and change the world from within. And so, you know, I, I like to believe that she was in a place during her time when she believed so strongly in the mission. And I think maybe she underestimated what was happening because of that naivete and kind of lost in her, her own world. But again, it is difficult to reconcile. It's not like the brown shirts weren't going around doing really horrific things in the twenties and a time when she was working there or that, you know, Hitler wasn't already, you know, um, in the Nazi party in Germany, where she had affiliations, not with the Nazis, but there were Montessori associations in Germany. She had, some of her students were killed in the concentration camps, her leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just horrific. Uh, and uh, in fact, and even in this section, so, but they're kind of a, a blindness. In this section of the book, she was in Amsterdam when the Nazis roll into town or are about to roll into town. And she flees, essentially, I would say she flees with her son yep. to India. And then like, Hey, let's get the kids out too, but it's too late. And so her grandchildren are, and trapped, are there. trapped there for the entirety mm -hmm. of the war. And then yeah. she comes back to Europe after having spent, and I, I don't want to speak, <laughs> I don't want to trash her too much, but she basically went to India, lived the life of a, uh, uh, of a God. Like she, she was, you know, she was treated like a saint everywhere she went. She lived in a mm -hmm. manch uh, in in a beautiful part of the world there in uh, Tamanaru, uh, had servants who were, <laughs> and then yeah, there she- There was no better place to live out the war. <laughs> no, like her struggle was like that she had to be bored. Yeah. And then she gets on an airplane, comes back to Amsterdam and realizes like the whole thing has been burned to the ground. And she's like, what happened here? And it's like, yeah, it's called World War II. It's so this is what happens when you play nice with fascists. It was naive to say the best, to say the least, yeah. uh, and it makes her message. It makes her legacy complicated. It also is complicated, I would say, in that she was always a person of extreme privilege. She never really suffered. She suffered, you know, in other ways. She had emotional trauma, of course. She had trauma from the separation with her son, uh, which obviously made a gigantic impact on her. Mm -hmm. But she didn't have material discomfort to the same way that many, many other people did. So it's not hard to imagine why she would have thought a material, a more material desire would elude her because mm -hmm. she never really struggled with that. She always had money. She always had comfort. There were always people to take care of her. Yeah. She always, you know, she lived out the rest of her life in, a, you know, one of the, one of the wealth, wealthiest, most beautiful parts of Europe yep. taken care of by her benefactors. And um, it's not that we don't want that for everybody, but it does sort of kind of feed into this idea of like, what did she really know of the world? Yeah. What did she really know about the suffering? Yes, she definitely worked with children and had in incredible capacity for love for them. Like and we see passion. that. Yeah. But she didn't, wasn't really within that. And it's another one of these contradictions that I think informs her life. And it, it doesn't excuse or it doesn't, condemn i think it's just a reality of who she is so when she in the latter part of her life when she becomes very spiritual and she says i don't want to be a pedagogist i don't want this to be about education i want this to be about um like the enlightenment of humankind mm -hmm. you're like that sounds great but uh europe has been burned to ash and six or seven million people have been marched to their death and there's destruction all over the world what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. How do we prevent this from happening? Um, it, there's a naivete in that as well. Like, yes, from children, we can learn much, but children aren't the We leaders. can't pin it all on children. <laughs> That's right. Children, yeah. you know, whatever that transformation that happens from childhood to adulthood that she was trying to really suss out at the end of her life, she never figured it out. And she never probably could figure out because it's the essential question of most of humankind. Yeah. And we have a long, long tradition of idolizing children. Her, her beliefs on childhood are reminiscent to me of like Wordsworth or Blake, mm -hmm. the neo-romantic, the, the, uh, 
proto-romantics and romantics uh, in, in the Western canon of, of uh, literature, the romantics uh, in the uh, early 19th century as they're responding to the first industrial revolution and the innocence, songs of innocence and experience as you know William Blake would write and so forth. And uh, we have that tradition like uh, in the 60s, the counterculture, there was this real you know, a, a ch child, uh, kind of the sense of like from a child comes you know purity. And it's true, a child does not create World War II. A mm -hmm. child does not... Uh, create fascism. A child does not create uh, economic uh, uh, hardship like we're facing even today. Like a child from a child did not come a nine dollar tube of toothpaste, but that child will eventually become an adult. From a child also did not become organized society. A child also did not create the arts and the world that we live in today and the science. So where does that change happen? And that she was really struggling with that. And I think that if there is a flaw in her, it comes from sort of this, I don't know if it comes from her life of privilege or just her guru like mind or her brilliance, but at some point there is a limitation to what, you know, we can expect, how we're going to transform society. And I, I think, you know, in my mind, it's really that she was unable to come to terms with the material reality. Uh, and I think that's because she didn't have to face a lot of material pain. And I think that's that's kind of part of her legacy that we don't necessarily like to think about, mm -hmm. but it's true. Like it, when we talk about why does Montessori lack the reach, or why is it hard, or why do we sometimes think of it in a kind of a cult-like language? I mean, I think that's a part of it. It is a fantastical thinking that we have to wrestle with as Montessori. Yeah, and why it uh, why there's a, this thread of elitism that runs throughout Absolutely. the training centers. I mean, yeah, and this this is you know not to to put blame on modern Montessorians in any particular way. Um, but, you know, this is something that like no human is perfectly perfect. Exactly. I think that Montessorians in particular, you know, we, we want to think of Maria as a perfect person because she was such a genius and she brought so much um, and her method was so good and it's still so good. Yeah. Her observations um, were right on. I don't disagree with yeah. her beliefs about, human potential and the child and the corruption of the material world on, on human society. I don't disagree. Of course, but there are lessons that we can learn uh, from her human journey, you know, as a, as a real life person who tried to change the world, you know, and did in some ways change the world. Um, and also in the limitations that she ran into, I think it's really, really important that we, collectively as Montessorians bring our, our awareness to a higher level than she had um, as a, as a person. That's right. I think it's interesting. I was thinking as I was reading this section about um, the journey of life, that it was very fitting. She mm -hmm. obviously had much more to contribute to the world than she had years to contribute. Right. I mean, it, at the end it depicts her, uh, her passing and uh, her last conversation is with Mario on, a, on the beds and, and they're basically, she's basically like, I want to go to Africa. I want to uh, do in Africa what we were doing in Asia and India and in, in the African nations. And he's like, I don't know that you can make that journey. And she's <laughs> like, oh, you think I'm too old for this? He goes off and he gets a map of Africa, comes back, and she's gone. She's passed. She's lying on the bed. Uh, and so to the very end. And, and she still had the energy and the desire to the, go and the excitement. You know, that was a the moment. The spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. That's right. That's right. Um, so I, I don't know if she could have lived another hundred years. I think she would have continued to persevere um, and want to bring new And maybe she would have been the, the person to bridge that. Maybe, maybe given her, you know, you think about the journey of her life from when she begins and she's working with the children and it is much more material. And she's thinking about the, that the mystery of childhood, the secret of childhood. Yeah. But by the end, she's thinking about adults. She's really progressing as she gets older. She thinks more and more about the progression of life. And, you know, she spends time thinking about high school, what we would call high school or middle school now she, and what that would look like. And then at the very end, thinking about adulthood mm -hmm. and the relationship of the adult back to the child. And maybe if she had another lifetime or two, something grand would have emerged. She, but it's not within the human capacity to live that long. Uh, and so there's another, I think, important lesson within her life that is a contradiction in a way, which is that there's... Her, because she held it so tightly, it has persisted, I think, in a way that other 
uh, pedagogical movements or movements of that era have not. I think because she was so dynamic and because she was so controlling, it really gave it a kind of a purity that could persist over time. And again, in other ways, ways that others didn't. On the other hand, it also meant that it died with her to some extent. Mm -hmm. We've continued her work. Mario continued to work. But there is no Maria part two. Well, the, the primary emphasis of um, both AMI and Mario's continued work with AMI was to preserve Maria's legacy. Um, and there is still a, that movement still exists out there to perfectly preserve her legacy, um, to leave it unchanged, uh, unmarred by new ideas. And um, there's I you know, I'll be honest, there's great growth in the Montessori education programs that are out today, not just AMI, but AMS as well and others. Um, and so I'm seeing a lot of great new, new inspired thought and an openness that is really appearing today, especially as uh, we have really been trying to deal collectively with the concepts of privilege and racism as communities. And that has dramatically affected the Montessori world as well. And I'm seeing a lot of new voices in, in those organizations that would not have appeared a decade or two ago. That's right. Um, so, you know, there is progress. Uh, but I think that any time that we say we've got to preserve a legacy, there should be a, some little red flags in there. Totally. Right. Um, and Maria herself, you know, she was she was very clear on how she wanted the method to be used and in what way. Uh, but she herself was not a person who was ever satisfied with what she had accomplished. She was always reaching for the next level, always reaching for more. You mentioned middle school and, and the yeah. high school age mm -hmm. teenagers. So I want to talk a little bit about what that means. Yeah. That might be new for some of the people who are watching. Yeah, because we're so, we, when we think about Montessori, we tend to think of the little ones. Yeah. Because it's where her most, you know, I guess her most revolutionary and well fleshed out work was done. Yeah, so we do. We tend to think about the little ones when we think about Montessori, and I think I would say typically parents usually discover Montessori in the toddler years. And Montessori toddlerhood is super, super hot right now. Um, I don't, I don't know why exactly it took off, but it did. It, it took off on its own on social media, especially. And so well, I think a it's lot a of people. Of the <laughs> corporatist nonsense that we're fed in our usual society yeah. for our schools. But yes, that's yes, another that thought, too. We're looking for something new. <laughs> something um, more natural, something pure, yeah, something less. Something centered on child development. Yeah, on the and, family and the child, the human. Yeah. So Montessori toddlerhood is really taking off. It's wonderful. I love it. And most parents discover Montessori during that time period of their child's life and start to implement the principles, which is wonderful. I, I would say that there is no too soon or too late to discover Montessori because children, um, the method just works from the beginning of life all the way through, really through the end of life. Um, so what Maria was trying to do in her last decade or two of life was she was really trying to take the method, learn what she had discovered about childhood in the early years, and then apply it older and older and older to really understand the whole span of the human life and to pay the same kind of respect to those older children that she really was trying to do with the younger children. And I think that where we run into some issues there is that during her period of time, no one was really educating the little ones yet. Like school for toddlers, toddler school was not a thing back mm -hmm. then. And it wasn't for preschoolers either. We still call it preschool as though it, like, it comes before real school. It's just what you do before your children are ready for school. And <laughs> Maria, <right. laughs> she was really trying to reinvent that. And she did. Yeah. Uh, she said, you know what? School is education. Education is life. And we're just trying to raise people. So why don't, why not start when they're little, um, as young as possible, we're, we're educating them because they're learning. And she really highlighted how amazing it was that these little children could teach themselves, especially when they were very, very little, they just had this immense capacity to learn. And then once they reached the age of six or seven, 
as is traditionally known, children are much more receptive to adult instruction. They can sit for longer periods of time. Their concentration naturally lengthens. Um, they're able, generally able to learn to read and write at that age, you know, to be some level of uh, self-education. Some, yeah, so is literacy is, is there. Um, and so Maria really, so what she did was she took the method that she had created for the little ones. And she just tried to imagine like, okay, so this is what school looks like for these older children. What if we were to reimagine that as a continuation of the journey that the younger ones are taking? And so a lot of people are very surprised when they do take our lower elementary course, because they didn't realize that the journey from early childhood isn't a completely separate one from no, those no, no, elementary no. ages. Uh, a lot of the same material materials are used. <laughs> um, a lot of the same lessons are even given during those two age groups. Uh, Maria, I think she really, she understood that children in different different stages of learning were going to perceive information differently at different times. So the same lesson that you might give, and so the an example might be Shell with Constellation's current theme of the month. Mm -hmm. You know, you give a you give a lesson in Shell uh, of Shell matching to little children. What are they looking for? They're looking for the details to to match the picture to the picture, or maybe they're matching the word to the word. They're learning vocabulary. What's an older child going to do? They can do the same lesson. They can do the same activity, but what are they going to get out of it? They are in a bigger stage uh, wanting to go deeper. And so maybe you end up having deeper conversations about the creatures that are in those shelves. Maybe you talk about where those shelves are harvested. Maybe you get into environmentalism with them and ethics with them. Like, and whatever you do, maybe talk about the cultural aspects of it. You, the learning, learning is learning at, at this diff these different That's ages. Right. But Maria understood that older children were more capable of not just learning more independently um, or concentrating for longer, but just like weaving their way in deeper into subjects. And she really didn't entirely create a totally new curriculum for those older age groups. She really wanted to expand upon it. And so as she noticed that the child's brain was changing, more abstract learning was more possible. So the subject matter kind of evolved, you know, to get bigger. Um, and as children grow older still, what she noticed, and she actually had children come into her home mm -hmm. during several different times, she still during those later years of her life considered herself a researcher. And she, so you can imagine her still wanting to invite children in, setting them up with some kind of work to do, or inviting a teacher over to come and interact with the children. She wanted to see them outside of their home environment because she really wanted to see what they would, how they would behave and act around each other rather mm -hmm. than around the adults that were continually regularly influencing them at their school or at their home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she kind of put them in this little environment together and then she just observed them, took notes. And so it was very much like back to the days of when she was first observing the young children uh, in early childhood. And what she noticed will come as really no surprise, I think. Uh, it's really that once children, as children are entering the period in their elementary years, they're like just, oh, they're just learning so, so much. They're capable of memorizing vocabulary words out the wazoo. And then when they reach the age of around 12 or so, there's a big shift away from the academics. Um, children become much more interested in their peers. Mm -hmm. They start uh, acting in ways that we perceive as adults as being kind of lazy. Um, <laughs> they start to defy you more often. You know, I don't have to listen to you. Rather than you know, the elementary child who was once like, uh, mom, you know, I want to learn more about this. And how does this happen? And what happens if we do this? And could we really go there? Turns into, eh, you know, uh, you don't know anything. <laughs> I, <laughs> I know everything there is to know about that. And I don't need to know any more about it. And they kind of sass you. You don't um, get me. Right. You don't understand. And uh, they just want to hang out with their friends. And Maria approached this, you know, regular school teachers and parents too might, might see this developmental shift as something to kind of be 
wary of <laughs> and something also that is kind of upsetting. You know, we see our children approach these phases of life and we're like, oh, what did I do wrong? I must have done something wrong because here I was so careful to educate them in this way or I put them in this great school or or whatever. And yet we, we reach this period just around age 12 and all of a sudden, you know, there's this lack of motivation and this lack of, of perceived interest in what we are trying to, to teach them anymore. And we think it must be our fault. But Maria didn't have that ego invested in it. She was just curious. Hi, Sabina. So she um, entered into it and she just was like, what? Why is this happening? You know, what does this say about the learning ability of these children? And, and she didn't think to herself, these lazy kids, they just don't want to learn That's anymore right. at this age. She thought to herself, huh, I wonder what they're learning. You know, what is it that they're trying to learn now? Because there must be, if there's this weird period in between um, when behavior really, really shifts, that's a signifier that something new is emerging. And she called it like a new birth. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in fact, the word adolescence, you know, kind of implies a transformation, a changing. And she witnessed this with joy and excitement. And she really got into um, learning about the stage of life. And I'm not really sure that she was finished learning about the stage of life. No, no. You know, she just kind of dare barely kind of dipped herself in it and, and started to kind of theorize. She did a lot of this, this theorizing in India, I think, you know. Yeah, um, she did. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, and she had teenagers there, you know, that she could observe. But um, she did come up with some really interesting ideas about what to do with teenagers that are very, very different from what we actually tend to do with our teenagers in our modern society. Absolutely you right. know, our our traditional path is to think of education as a um, as a journey of where you know less and then you know more and then 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 finally you're an adult. And so your learning would look very similar, you know, in that in that line. And kind of like a, I like that because I think we often try to imagine it like a, not, stair step, a stair, right? staircase yeah. instead of a line. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like now I'm pre kindergarten, now preschool, I'm now here. I'm in primary. Now I'm in middle school. Now I'm in whatever. Yes. So you like as though you're making these jumps when in reality you are growing, but it's not that a way at all. That's the wrong way to depict it. The right way to depict it, I think you and I would both argue, is the spiral. Mm -hmm. That uh, what we're talking about is a spiraling for education. That it's about going deeper and the connectivity amongst those ideas as you continue to go. And it's really different than how we tend to think about education uh, more generally. It is. But during this period of adolescence, there's something that happens to that spiral that breaks it. Um, the amount of knowledge that children acquire up until about age 12 is kind of like Maria exactly. imagined it like a balloon. That's right. It was like, you're blowing up the balloon and then it reaches capacity. Uh, children know a lot by the time they get to age 11 and typical 11 year olds are full of facts. If you meet in a, a 10 or 11 year old out in the wild, they are probably going to tell you all about their favorite subject. Um, they're often very, very chatty they, and they have an immense amount of knowledge. So much knowledge that you're always thinking, oh, I didn't know you were that smart. Oh, where did you learn that oh, thing? So you know, brilliant. you're so right. <laughs> where did you learn all this information? Like I didn't teach you all of this stuff. Where did you get it? Uh, and then for us, it's always like, I guess he learned it on YouTube because you can't imagine where else would he have learned this. But the truth is um, that just by the by the time the balloon has been blown up and it's like really, really tight, your child's brain is just so packed with so much knowledge about the world that they really are ready to explode. And then they do. They explode into puberty um, and the brain, what we know from neuro, modern neuroscience images of teenagers' brains is that they go through this period, this period where their brain is actually culling knowledge. So they acquire all this knowledge up into a point and then all of a sudden their brain is like, okay, stop, stop, everybody stop, no more knowledge, no more knowledge. I mean, it's literal. It's amazing. Um, and now is the time to prune it. <laughs> so now let's see. Which what, of this stuff do I actually need to remember? Yeah, like, what okay, so use? what are you using? Right? And the brain does this. And it takes about three years, three, four years to do this process of pruning. Um, probably like two years to do the most of the pruning. But I think it happens really all up until about age 15. Most of the pruning happens. Yeah, so if you're aware of this 
stages of the planes of development, right? This is, it aligns perfectly with this concept of the third plane, right? The mm -hmm. first half of the third plane is the calling. Yeah. So, um, so that is why children appear lazy at this age. That's why children uh, defy you and don't, you know, seem to have an interest in academics at this particular age because their brains are full and they need to go through the process of, of culling information so that they can get to a different stage, which is kind of you know, being able to critically think about all of this information that is relevant to them. It's so, kept the stuff that they think Yeah. So by the, by the time children are about 15 years old, they've really had a lot of time to go through this pruning process. And now they're starting to be able to think, okay, uh, I, now I have a, you know, I've forgotten a lot of stuff that I used to know. And that I, I think we've noticed from our boys that there is actually an awareness of, I think I used to know how to do that, but I don't remember anymore. Right. Um, and so we've had to talk to them about like, it's natural. You're going to remember the things that you, that you do. And that is in fact how we adults yeah, handle our lives too, yeah, right? That's right. We, no adult things, remembers everything. No, There are no. things that are more memorable to you than others, and that's why we have. How many to help facts us. do we have to memorize in the sixth grade? That like totally math or mathematics. Remember. You know, we learn so much in mathematics, but in our day to day life, we use a, a a most fraction. most yeah. of us, at least, unless we're you know a mathematician or something, are using a small percentage of that, and it can be scary to the child who's like, I used to know how to do all this stuff, and mm -hmm. now I can't anymore. And to help them sort of understand, like, it's okay. Like, you understand the principles, you've maintained, you retain the things that matter, and you know how to go back and find that information again if you need to. Uh, and that's a scary, it's very scary. It feels, it must feel it a bit like a death in a way. Like, yeah. some, you know, so, a death and a rebirth. Yeah. And Maria, she named this period Erdkinder, which really means children of the world, you know. So they're going through this period where they're, they're becoming, citizens of the world they're they're starting to have this awareness of where their place is in the world and there's so much more that we could talk about that happens during this period of life um, but i think that probably one of the most interesting things to people who are learning about montessori is that what she dreamt of during this time what she conceived of and envisioned as being a great environment for these children was a place where they could decompress where they were not beholden to all of the responsibilities uh, and expectations of harsh academics and she talked um, quite literally about how these children should not be graded during this time. This is not a time to judge them for their work. She wanted the physical work and the academic work to be equal. She, you know, she wanted the children to be out there doing physical material things, not just academic mental yeah. activities. Yeah. And so there's kind of a returning, I don't know if you've ever heard that the teenagers are kind of similar to three-year-olds and it's developmentally what Maria was observing herself. Um, so these are children who are at a stage where they need to return to practical life work. And so that is what she envisioned for them. And so she was trying to think what would practical life look like for a teenager? You know, it's obviously not going to be pouring. <laughs> or spooning things you know right. it's what is what is it gonna be so uh as it would feel appropriate to somebody living in the 1940s where agriculture was still a, you know a really huge profession yeah. that a lot of adults engaged in around them um she thought you know what how about an internship where they actually go and they become managers of a farm you know what if they were to actually be able to strengthen their new muscles by shoveling manure. And they were able to challenge um, their knowledge of math by applying it in a real life situation, thinking about the, the business aspect of the farm. Mm -hmm. And so what if we turned a lot of this over to the children and not just said, oh, here's a farm, teenagers go run it. But what if we also had other adults who were like supportive and could work alongside them, you know, who weren't just super Supervising the kids shoveling the manure, but like we're we're out there helping them. That's right. She said that the adult and the child yeah. should learn in equal measure. Absolutely. And so what if those adults were to have stimulating conversations with those children, you know, just, just about the world or about what they're interested in? And I think that even though she didn't know specifically that what the brain was doing is pruning, <laughs> I think that she she was able to describe what was happening anyway, you know, That's in her right. language, you know, and, and I think that the vision that she had of this environment that would be appropriate for teenagers 
shows that deep understanding that what teenagers really need is very supportive adults around them, role models, um, and to feel important, like they're really making a difference. They're doing um, they're doing some big work in the world. Yeah, they're working. I mean, you think about yeah. the history of humankind. I mean, schools are a relatively new invention, especially the idea of like the current idea of schools are pretty, pretty new. Uh, but it doesn't mean learning is new. Like we've been doing that since the get go. Right. And uh, it just happened in a different way. It happened through mentorships, apprenticeships, learning, being part of the tribe, going, how do you learn how to hunt? You learn how to hunt by hunting. How do you learn how to farm? You learn to farm by farming. You go out and you uh, interact with the world and you apply the things that you've learned to uh, a craft. So what would a, what should a junior high or a high school look like? A high school should look like uh, uh, probably a print shop. It should look mm -hmm. like a farm. It should look like a grocery store. It should look like, not because you're necessarily training people to be, uh, to stock groceries or make t-shirts in a print shop or, or whatever, but because those are physical activities that require them to use all of the competencies. Mm -hmm. She she did not think that there, if for this age group, there should be subject areas. You should just be yeah. applying naturally in the same way that, you know, right now as we're having our conversation we're applying all kinds of things that we've learned over the course of our life. I'm trying to think back to the history I learned and the geography yeah. and thinking about the literary, you know, critical literary analysis skills that we learned. And there are, you know, there's math that we're trying to think through, you know, thinking about a calendar and how many days till this or that event, you know, thinking about time management. This is a gigantic number of skills. They're not separated. We don't expect you know, adults to say, now is, now you're going to think about time management. Okay, time to stop. <laughs> In fact, we know from our research that when we do force people to switch between little tasks over and over, it costs a huge amount of you know wear and tear. It's called switching cost. So we know it's like terrible. Like, don't do that. Let people work in a sustained way and use all of these different skills that they have together. Uh, but we don't do that with children. We don't model for children. We don't let the child go out and explore and learn how to do that to actually become uh, educated in a more, I would, I, I would argue, in an authentic way. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's fascinating. Like she really made this observation. We've had some, you know, we flirted with that in the past. Sometimes you'll see a vocational school every now and again. But as our society has kind of progressed into the 21st century, we've become very, very assessment oriented, very, very standardized objective oriented because those things are easier to measure and then measure you can tie to financing so it all kind of ties together it's not good for the child it's good for the political and economic system um and when we do try things like vocational school they tend to get you know they, they tend to go away there aren't as many as there used to be uh, and even the vocational school itself is not exactly what she would imagine but it's mm -hmm. kind of getting closer so and i, I unfortunately not only are these ideas radical for her time they're even becoming more and more uncommon, despite the fact that we know even more and more about how the brain works and how children learn. And our world is changing, and you would think that we would adapt our educational system to uh, to actually match, but we don't. It's just kind of stuck, um, which is a shame. I think the other piece, you know, I kind of I gave sort of the like I condemned poor Maria <laughs> for her associations with fascism earlier, and now but now I'll say the inverse. She lost many decades of her life to the to war. To uh, she had to flee from one place to the next. She was in India, where she yes, she lived in material comfort. But what she wanted to do was work. And so mm -hmm. it's uh, when I would say like, what did she suffer? Oh, she she was bored. Actually, she suffered something really great, which was that she wanted more than anything to use her gift to study, to understand. And that was her true genius. Mm -hmm. Her true genius is that she didn't just have these theories about childhood. She would then study them with an immaculate care, just this like precision. She had this incredible ability to have the empathy, to put herself in the, the point of view of the child, to strip away her adult societal uh, pre preconceived notions and just think what are they experiencing in a way that was incredibly transformative and unique. And, and basically, I don't know anybody who, there's probably very, very few people on the earth who have anywhere close to that level. Like she was a true genius. She was a true, uh, a truly unique soul on the earth. And in the moment when she was really trying to study these older children, 
teens and then into adulthood, she was getting older and much of her life uh, had been sort of stripped down uh, because of the collapsing of society around her. And for that reason, you can understand why she would have such a naive blindness to the political situ situation around her, because to her, she's on a mission. She has this driven mission. She's really wanting to do, she wants to work in a place where she can study children and, and adults of, at some point mm -hmm. to on how they work. And she needs a place to do that, which means she needs a society that's stable and protective of her because that's just how it works. And if that means making deals with the devil in order to try and progress this grander vision, then so be it. Now, again, it's for us to decide in the 21st century as we're looking back, does the sin, <laughs> does, the, does the outcome outweigh the sin or vice versa? And I would say like, she's only human. And uh, she did what she thought was the best that she could do. And yes, we can condemn her, but we can also sort of understand, we can also have that empathy to understand like why she might've had this kind of blindness. It's because she was really driven. She really believed to end the war, to end suffering, to end the misery, the immiseration. Not just the war, but all war. To end war. Yeah. The, you know, the suffering of people, you had to unlock what it was inside of the child that you could figure out how, what's happening that it's becoming um, twisted as you age. What are we as adults doing to children when we make them sit passively and listen, when we teach a child subservience? Mm -hmm. What are we doing to them mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and to their potential? Is that why we continue to have these terrible economic conditions that afflict us over and over and over again, these terrible wars that afflict us, this terrible violence, is this where it comes from? Because we're unable to um, stop um, brainwashing children. <laughs> I think she would argue, yes, like yep. that, that is where it comes from. And uh, in order to transform society, we have to start there. And if that means um, turning a blind eye or paying less attention than you might want to, um, to, or should have to certain events that are happening in the world, but, uh, you can sort of understand, you can't necessarily forgive. I don't know that it's a forgivable thing, but it is definitely an understandable thing, like where that comes from. Yeah. Sabina had a comment here. Yes, it is difficult to read about it. We, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, um, yeah, we both got to that section of the book and the book. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you have to deal with it. I mean, yeah. you know, there's something important. I think her life represents, um, in a nutshell, she sort of embodies the human condition, right? She is, she's drawn to God, but defined by human limitations, the animal, the material. She is inventive and transcendent in time, and yet very much a Victorian lady. She is... Um, focused absolutely on peace and mm -hmm. yet doesn't advocate in the strongest possible terms for peace and against those who are perpetuating violence in the world. Like the, she's a contradiction because she is a human. We are all contradictions mm -hmm. and it's very, very, you know, like we want, I think we often want to make our heroes into something more than they can really be. And kind of what we have to learn is like to err as human, to forgive divine. Yeah. So um, before we leave the topic of Erdkinder, the adolescence, yeah. I just want to tell everyone who doesn't know that there are Montessori farm schools out there. A few. There aren't too many, There are not very many, but you should definitely look them up. I will say that those schools, I think, struggle because um, often the, the parents who enroll their children in these these schools have expectations that their children are going to do well on the college placement tests and get into great schools um, and continue their journey in college. Um, and so there, there's this question of, okay, how, how much Montessori can we really do 
Um, without consequence. Without consequence, right. Uh, so can we really, is it really okay to take our 12 to 15 year olds and say, hey, you know what, we're going to kind of unschool them for a while and let them play around on the farm for a few years and it'll probably turn out fine. Because yeah. we know it'll make them a better human being. Yeah, I mean. Maybe, it, more, it, it, maybe more satisfied as a human in some yes, way. Yes, but that's really hard for the public to swallow um, because we just, you know, it's not accountable for. Like, how are we going to test those kids? Yeah, what and, are these layabouts? Well, what happens when they get to be 16 years old and they haven't learned anything in three years? Um, and so there's kind of a conflict between societal expectations of what middle schoolers and young teenagers should be doing and learning during their daily life and uh, what is best for their development. And it's just really hard for the schools to meet both. But there definitely are schools out there doing really innovative things and trying. Some of them are really dedicated to the old school farm itself. You know, so you'll see a school that's out there and they actually have a farm out in the country that they invite teenagers to come to. Sometimes it's a boarding school type of situation where teenagers will come from all over the country or, or all over the world to come to this special school where they get to be on a farm with other teenagers without their parents and without adults. I kind of have personal mixed feelings about boarding schools with children. I think that there's a lot of evidence out there that is modern research that says how incredibly important parental influence is during the teenage years. Um, so I'm really happy that we are homeschooling our children during this time of life when they their brains are not developed enough to make great adult-like decisions on their own. That's we right. are their support system. You know, we're there to uh, help continue to guide them during this time of life, you know, right. so I've never wanted to send my child away to a school, but um, that is an option. There are also Montessori schools out there for older children that take a bit of a different, more modern approach. Uh, so instead of a farm, they try to take more of an internship based on modern careers. So maybe children go to that school and what they really are working on is, is like coding mm -hmm. or um, animation or I don't know what's a entrepreneur is a sure. really big deal in Montessori. A lot of Montessori schools focus heavily on entrepreneurship, on yeah. helping children to feel empowered, um, learning about small businesses. A lot of the schools will have the children create their own business. So maybe you don't have a, a working farm, but those kids are invited to say, hey, uh, why don't you guys start a business? And what could your business be? Could you sell t-shirts? Could you make things and sell them? You know, what, what could you do? And you know, whether they end up making a lot of money or not, it's not the point. It's really more about the learning process and it being a very hands-on experience for those kids and an empowering experience for them during this time of life. And then Maria noticed that as children get even older, they approach the age of 16 to 25, I guess, they're kind of enter more into a more academically interested period again, you know, so it's not like, that period of pruning lasts <laughs> forever until adulthood. Like they, they kind of pass through that age of puberty and emerge on the other side, a lot more mature and responsible, you know, even though they're not fully development, fully developed yet. Um, and so she saw that being a period of time where children would be encouraged to pursue a subject that they are really interested in specializing in and to help them specialize in that topic. And again, that is a departure from the way we expect our older teenagers to become fully fluent in a variety of subjects <laughs> and then go into a college environment where they would again be immersed in a for another four years yeah. of not really specializing yet. I, but, I'm not here to condemn the liberal arts education having yeah. spent <laughs> more time and money than is necessary in pursuit of one. I have a master's in literature, but I also know that we study American literature because we want, because of Americanism. Like yeah. it was invented in the 19th century, introduced as a topic, just like American studies in the 20th century to promote America as having validity as a world culture in the same way that the Romans did. It's not to say that we shouldn't read great works of American literature, or British literature, or French literature, or Chinese literature, or whatever. It's just to say that there's more to it than just sort of knowledge. So the liberal education that we, liberal arts education that we, you know, put children through over and over again, isn't necessarily because it's what research says is the best thing for the child. Mm -hmm. It's as much a political, social, economic decision as anything else, as are most things when it comes to school. School is big business. I think a lot of, you know, uh, 
in these days, back when we were going to college for, I knew it was a lot easier for us to get scholarships and to college was cheaper as Much well. Much cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I loved my college experience. Too, um, and part of the reason I think so many of us who went to a four-year college and had that traditional liberal arts experience um, really loved it so much is because that, that's kind of the first time that a lot of us had the, really the freedom to pick and choose what we wanted to study. And that's something that we don't generally offer our teenagers is exactly. that autonomy and that choice in what they want to learn. It was just like I was given this immense, beautiful menu of all of these things I could possibly learn about. And it was so exciting um, and just empowering to say, yeah, I don't want to learn about these things. I have to have these credits. And so, but I have these choices, you know, and these things that I could choose. Um, you yeah. know, I took sign language for my foreign language and just love that so much. Uh, college opened up a lot of a lot of things for me in terms of seeing myself as an, being the owner of my own education in a way that my traditional high school penned me into a box and just kind of told me what to that's right what to learn yeah i mean so, every human deserves should has the right and should be given the opportunity to go on that journey of self discovery it the, our sin as a society is that we uh, tend to not allow that, and right? So it's, even even in the context where we have invested billions of dollars in effort, like in a public education high school, uh, we don't we don't provide that. Like you, it's you know, it's not impossible to imagine that you could provide a high school experience that really did emphasize the self discovery and finding yourself and exploring ideas. Uh, that that's it's just the choice that we make not to do it, yeah. which is why for some of us, we make the choice to try and find a better, a different balance uh, by homeschooling or choosing alternate paths. Yeah. So really, you know, I think one of the big lessons we can take away from Maria's method in her life is the importance of giving children choice in their learning um, and respecting what they choose. And this is true uh, from, you know, we don't need to wait until a child goes to college um, and then has some choices in what classes they want to take. We should be giving them the option to choose their own path right from the very beginning, whether it's with that little baby that we offer several toys to and then say, oh, you know, which one do you like? And in the Montessori way, you don't just put your baby in the middle of the floor and then just give them some toys to play with. There is this very gentle method of offering something to the child. It's actually very, very special and something very lovely. And I think quite unique to the Montessori method, the way that even the little babies um, look up at their caregivers and instead of just shoving a toy into their hands, you know, we, we offer it up to them and we say, Ooh, would you like this? And we wait for the baby to, to reach out for it. And if it's not something that they're interested in, we say, Oh, maybe this isn't interesting to you right now. Would you like this instead? And we do this even before they were able to crawl and go over to something physically. And we start to offer these experiences to our children right away. And that is one of the reasons that Montessori really does begin in those such early in life, you know, even with little babies, you can start to offer these choices. And then you can see how, you know, with toddlers, we're offering them different, you know, what food would you like? I mean, it just continues, the choices just continue and continue. And then when they reach that period where they're in puberty, one of the choices is, would you like to play with your friends right now <laughs> again? Or would you like to read this book with me? You know, and, and these are choices that children are still able to make, even when they're in those rocky periods of development. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the lessons really is that if we raise our children to believe that they should have this choice all the way through their childhood, that they're not always just caged into what other people think they should be learning, they will really learn to see themselves as lifelong learners, you know, which is the whole goal, you know, yeah. this is, you know, one of the biggest goals, and I won't say not the ultimate goal, because obviously, um, you know, Maria believed in, in uh, the, the idea that we could create peace among humanity, all of humanity is being like the biggest goal, right, in being in harmony with our environment and being in harmony with each other really uh, was like the ultimate goal, but kind of, you know, really thinking practically for us as parents, what do we want our children to feel like when they are our age? Do they want 
Do we want them to see themselves as still having choices, as being empowered beings, as being interested and still curious about the world? Of course. Mm -hmm. So it seems so clear what we need to do for them when they're very little children. We need to treat them with with gentleness and kindness and incredible respect during every single part of their journey um, from all the way from childhood to adulthood and then beyond. Yeah. That's right. The person you are or I am is a continuation. When we look at a child, whatever the age of that child, and we see, you know, let's say we interpret it as misbehavior or whatever, it, it's tempting to get angry. It's tempting to say, oh, they're being naughty or whatever, or it's misbehavior. And I think what Maria would teach us is that we need to put ourselves in the shoes of that child or uh, from that child's perspective and think like, what is it that they're trying to do? They're doing some work. There's something happening. You know, we, all of us were children once. And the thing that, you know, what, what would frustrate us as adults would frustrate a child as well. And thinking through that, it's also the other thing I think Maria would teach us, tell us that, is that we are the, that the people we are is the product of all those experiences, that spiral journey through those planes of development. What did we learn? How did we sort it? Where did we get to apply it? What kinds of sensorial activities or practical life experiences did we have early on? What was the nurturing? What type of nurturing environment did we have? And when we should think about, I, I guess the call would be thinking about our own self and saying, are we the people we want to be? Because we are a product of all those things. And then looking at our, the young people in our lives, saying, what kind of person do I want you to be? What am I going to do to give you the better life, to make you the better person, to give you the confidence to go out and be a total human being uh, with a spiritual and a, a life and a physical uh, understanding of the physical world and just satisfied in a way that actually matters on the earth. That journey starts from before birth and continues all the way. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's uh, to bring us back to the work that we are doing to continue the Montessori journey here in the modern world. Um, you know, we, we don't see our role as only teaching parents how to teach children. You know, what we discover is that parents who come into our programs are also learning how to be better human beings themselves. That's what Maria and, discovered as well. Yes. And I think that there's this, there's just this beautiful opportunity that happens when you have little children. If you're watching and you have little ones, this is your moment. This is your moment to, to, to get your curiosity engaged again, to not feel... To be the person you want to be. Yes. <laughs> um, and also, you know, just... The, the world can be really heavy sometimes. You know, people don't yeah. always get along. We've got a lot of stress. Uh, when inflation hits, it it can really up, increase our stress levels and make us kind of out of touch with that that really deep, beautiful. Yeah, when our material part concerns overwhelm, it makes it harder to be focused on the spiritual path. So this is a time of life when you can rekindle that curiosity in yourself and really see the world in an optimistic, uh, beautiful way that children naturally seem to have the capacity to do. That's right. All right. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, this is where we're going to end the part five series, friends. That's right. Um, but we'll Good be back. Good comment there from Sabina at the end. Yeah, I think it'd be great. You know, I was thinking about the spiral and you said, well, you know, there's also the, in the planes. And I, I was thinking, we, I wonder if we can make like a visual because it is a spiral. I knew you were going to go Then you go <laughs> into these different planes, the sensor, you know, the sensory period and then the period of abstraction and the sorting period. It is just, a, I think it'd be very interesting because it is that continued spiral that we continue even to this point, you know, as middle-aged adults, I'm continuing to, to spiral and think, but, um, through the different planes and how our brains work uh, and our life works, uh, it can change that perception. So very interesting. I'd love to do, maybe that could be our next topic. Oh yeah. I mean, I can talk so much about spirals because, you know, the having studied the lower elementary curriculum, yes. you're giving the children the universe. And once you start discovering the universe, you start realizing spirals and are everywhere. <laughs> Exactly. I know. Even in Shell this month, we've been exploring the Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci sequence um, right. And I'm just, I keep seeing it everywhere I go. <laughs> like we go, we went to the rose, a rose garden and I was like looking at all the roses. Yeah. Like, wow. Yeah, there it is. Uh, we pick up the shells nature. on the beach. And we're like, there it is inside the shells. Um, 
I don't know. I was it's picking amazing. up, yeah, cauliflower at the store. The anyway, it's yeah, just these fractals and yes, things. It's and amazing. learning is the same way. Well, it's been fun. I've loved this book. Thank you for bringing it to me. If you haven't read it, go pick it up. Get it at your library. Ask your library for it. Go buy a copy. Uh, it's really, really good. Yeah, and again, we're not affiliated with no, anything. We don't know her. We don't know this person. Yeah, or, but what a what but she did a, a really, good job. She wrote a great book. She wrote a great book. Thought provoking and I think relevant to the time. Yeah, and it's definitely definitely a book that I'll be keeping on my shelf and referring back to. Um, you know, in in the work that we continue to do in the Montessori community. That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, take care, everyone. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye.